welcome to the Conception Channel Podcast. Hello everyone, welcome to the Conception Channel Podcast brought to you by the Being Fertile Program and Yin Still Reproductive Wellness. I'm your host, Spence Pentland, and today I'm very excited to speak with our special guest, Dr. John Havelock. He's here to help us better understand fertility and aging as a whole and we'll I know we're we we're just talking before we hit record here tonight that we'll we'll get into the role of PGS and IVF uh, and ovarian reserve testing and and some of the common questions that come with uh, aging and fertility um, John is a board certified reproductive endocrinologist and, uh, uh, and specialist in infertility uh, that in lay terms is uh, an IVF physician. Um, he's spent the last 11 years as a co-director uh, and founder of Pre- the Pacific Center of Reproductive Medicine in Vancouver, uh, more accurately Burnaby, uh, British Columbia. I there's <clears throat> John. I wish I I knew what uh, all the letters were behind your name, uh, <laughs> and I'm going to get you to maybe introduce. Uh, uh, a bit more of your story because I know you uh, are a lot more involved uh, in, in things uh, than this, but uh, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'll give, give you a little bit of background about myself, Spence. Oh. A lot of it you already know, but yeah. for your audience. Uh, both of us, uh, fortunately, have um, the, uh, the uh, pleasure of being from Friendly, Manitoba. I grew up just outside of Winnipeg. Yeah. <laughs> did my uh, did my med school and undergrad training at the uh, University of Manitoba, and then um, then moved to uh, Edmonton, Alberta, at the University of Alberta for five years, and did my specialty training in obstetrics and gynecology, and then finally did my subspecialty training down in the United States in uh, Dallas, Texas, at the University of Texas Southwestern, and after finishing there in 2006, decided to come back to Canada, somewhere a little bit warmer. Like yourself in Winnipeg, you moved to yeah. the West Coast yep. and have been in Vancouver for almost 12 years now practicing at uh, PCRM. Awesome. I, John and I have, have, have become friends over the years and, I, and it's, uh, it's been a great relationship and, and uh, to have someone like John as, as a resource. And, and thanks for coming on the show. For, I, I, uh, but I just think there's so so much that we sit and, and chat about, and partly why maybe I started this podcast is to get some of the conversations that I am fortunate enough to have with you know world leaders, you know, and in 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 the reproductive health field, and discover you know the stories and and you know the you know the psychology and everything that has led a to to your, your success and as uh, uh, a physician and at PCRM and just, you know, to be able to pull, you know, some of the pearls and, and wisdom and knowledge that you have that, you know, so many women out there just even considering IVF or it just floating past their radar or having even been through a, a few cycles uh, will really benefit from. So, so I'm excited. So what, so let's, let's dive in. I mean, you, uh, when I asked uh, John what he wanted to speak about, so it was fertility and aging. And I, and that is, you know, I, that's primarily what I would see at my clinic as well. So I, uh, um, I would love for you to, to, to just give an overview of, of why that was was something that you would you wanted to talk about today? Yeah, and and with respect to fertility and aging, I'll will talk about essentially the the fertility aspect of, of the reproductive effects of aging, less so than the than the obstetrical uh, effects. Um, one of the reasons I think it's worthwhile to to, to speak about is um, over the past forty years or so, we see in in most developed countries and definitely in Canada a trend towards women having their first child at, at a younger age so the, the you know the average age of, of, of a mother for the first child was in the early uh, 20s in the in the 1970s and now we're up to uh, close to around 29 years of age for a first mother and then if you look at British Columbia um, it, it tends to be the the province where women delay 
having children the longest compared to the rest of Canada. And, and there's a number of theories why that may be. A lot of it probably has to do with, you know, cost of living, ed, you know, delaying for education, uh, being in the workplace. Uh, a lot of these things um, obviously uh, result in, in delayed or deferred childbearing and has resulted in, in increased age for, for first-time mothers and, and all mothers in Canada. Uh, it is more difficult to get pregnant as, as you get older, and, and that's why we're, we're seeing more and more couples presenting for, for infertility when there doesn't seem to be any other cause other than we assume there's probably an age-related component. Right, right. I had no idea about, about British Columbia or, the, or that statistic about from 40 years ago to today. And that yeah. socioeconomic, I mean, it, it's got to be primarily just due to you know, the pressures of life, the, the financial aspect. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, you know, the, the, the really the, the big reproductive demographic changes that have, have, have occurred really, even, even since probably the, you know, the, 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 the baby boomer era. So, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you go back 150 years ago, people would have an average six or seven children. There was, right. uh, was high, um, you know, uh, childhood mortality and neonatal mortality. Uh, but there were very large families. Right. Um, there was no contraception. Uh, and right. uh, our countries were really developing countries. Now, as countries become developed and they get access to contraception, uh, typically that brings the birth rate down. But we had a a replacement birth rate in Canada probably until the uh, early 1970s. And it, and it was really around then where Again, you see that demographic shift where people are having their children later, and we're also having fewer children. Right. You know, so the average number of kids that that, that you know the the, the the fertility rate is is around 1.6, where you need you know a little over two to really balance out your population. You don't you you don't see a declining population can at this point in time because that group from the 1940s are still you know, like you and me, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to say middle age, but in our forties, yeah. And we <laughs> yeah. haven't seen that, that, um, that, uh, d demographic age, you know, most of us are still alive and you, you won't see really a declining fertility or declining population in Canada probably until later this century. Again, the other balancing uh, act for Canada, which makes us a wonderful country is a, you know, very liberal immigration policy. And, and so these are some of the things that have really allowed us to maintain our, our population. But it is it definitely a, a very interesting with respect to the, the, the changing demographics where people are having their families later, right. and are just having fewer children. Well, and, and women may be stepping into uh, or focusing on career more so yeah. today than than in the past. And, and, uh, just delaying, uh, uh, it, you know, the pr prioritizing finding finding a, a partner, yes, a husband yeah. or, or whoever. Um, yeah. Okay, so and so, and 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 just further to that, and we we yeah. can we can probably expand this a little bit later and, and going a little bit off topic, you know. So so you know, with 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 uh, with with career and uh, and education sometimes re resulting in 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 people delaying. You know, you know, um, having children. The uh, uh, question I often get asked to you by people who haven't had children and wanting delay is, how long can I wait? And that's a right. question I can never really answer. I can give you, you know, a little bit in, in the way of probabilities, but I can never tell anyone, oh, you're going to be fertile today, and I know three years from now you won't. Right. Uh, you don't know anybody's fertility until they they try to conceive. Right. Uh, you know, there are some things now that you can um, do to potentially. You know, preserve your fertility. So, so things like egg freezing is is something at least for for women who experience an age related decline in fertility. Unlike men who don't experience nearly the decline, you know, people can look at things like egg freezing. But even egg freezing, I, I tell people, it's not the holy grail. It, it's right. not. Uh, it's it's an insurance policy that doesn't always pay off. Right. Um, and, and there's a cost associated with it. But again, with the technology of egg freezing, it does provide um, individuals with some option. But nothing, you know, when people are asking, can I have, a, can I get pregnant now? I say, really, there's nothing better. The, the true gold standard test is you just got to try. Right. So what, so why, so can you explain a little bit of why the egg freezing isn't, isn't a holy grail? You know, yeah. is, isn't, yeah. So, so there's a couple issues, and again, with with respect to aging, which we always talk about, with with you know, female-related aging, um, right. there's uh, a, an age-related decline in both a quantity right. and quality. 
Mm. Quality probably being the most important factor, and that's purely related to age. Right. Um, the, there's a number of factors that the big issue is the eggs don't sort their genetic material as well, so they may be missing chromosomes or have extra chromosomes, and that, that happens a lot with a lot greater frequency as women get into their late 30s, early 40s, and also quantity. When you when you try to stimulate their ovaries for an IVF cycle or an egg freezing cycle, uh, they tend not to make as many as they get older. So the chance of having an offspring from eggs that have been frozen really depends on the age of when you froze them right. and how many you freeze. So at least from, from some da data out of Spain, if you get 15 or more eggs and you're 35 years of age or under, you've got about an 85% chance of having a child from those eggs in the future. Okay. If you're 36 and above, you know, 30, and usually you're, you're looking late 30s to maybe 40 at most, and you have 11 or more, you might be looking more like half that, a little over 40%. So it's really a quality and quantity issue. But quality, age by far being the biggest factor. Okay, okay. So can you, okay, age is, age is just bottom line the, the biggest factor when, when uh, uh, a woman or a couple are, are, is trying to conceive. So what, what happens physiologically? Can you kind of give a rundown of what occurs in the body to cause that? Yeah, well, so quantity-wise is pretty, pretty, pretty simple. Un unlike men, where sperm can be you know, reproduced from from the, basically the spermatogonium, they 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 essentially a, a renewable population that never really gets exhausted. Yeah. Eggs are a little bit different. Uh, the, the, you you know, woman, how many eggs she's born with, that's all she's going to have, and. Each month, one of those grows into a mature follicle and ovulates, and if conception doesn't occur, it dies off. But really, there's a cohort or group of eggs that die every every month. You only see the dominant follicle, but there's a group that dies. And so um, at birth, you're looking at maybe having 1 million oocytes at, at puberty, maybe 500,000. And, and then, you know, by the time you get to menopause, you know, maybe you're looking in the order of, of a thousand or so. Um, okay. and, and, and so you, you really that, that quantity, you, you, you just, it's just a function of declining numbers and having a non-renewable -renew pool. With respect to quality, the issue becomes for some reasons, and there are some theories why this occurs, that uh, the, as the eggs as they get older, instead of producing an egg with 23 chromosomes and the sperm having 23 to, to result in a, a normal conception with 46 chromosomes, there'll be 22 or 25 chromosomes. It's thought that some of the molecules that help keep the chromatid pairs together, they're, they're really, you know, these the chromosomes are in, in pairs, chromatid pairs, and typically they should split off and one goes into the oocyte and the other one goes into the polar body, which, which in, in the genetic division just gets, it's essentially the genetic garbage that okay, we don't, okay. we don't mm -hmm. um, there, there are these molecules, molecules called cohesins that, that hold these, these, um, these, uh, chromatids together. And it seems with aging, both, both the quantity and the function of uh, cohesin, uh, molecules, uh, diminishes. And okay. so because of that, they may separate early and not sort themselves properly. And so you either have an extra one in, in, in the oocyte or you're missing one because of that. That's what the theory is. What we do know definitely, we're not completely clear, we do know definitely from the, the pre-implant, the PGS or the chromosome screening, embryo chromosome screening data is that um, there definitely is a higher prevalence of chromosomal abnormalities in the egg with age. And by the time age 44, you're looking above 90% of the embryos are going to be chromosomally abnormal. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, you, you touched on, or you slipped PGS in there. And I think, mm -hmm. uh, I think I want to, uh, get you to clarify yeah. what, what that is. That's, that's from my understanding, that's testing for, uh, on the, on the embryos that is done primarily during an IVF after some embryos that are, mm -hmm. are, have developed are frozen and, and, and it helps with, with understanding more about the embryos. Can you, but can you a tell everybody, you know, what the different acronyms are that yeah. are, I, we were talking about that the other night, I remember, but, uh, and, and just a little bit about it. Yeah. 
So um, there, there have been a number of acronyms. You know, people have called it pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. It's not really diagnosis. More commonly, it's been pre-implantation genetic screening. Right. Uh, another commonly used acronym is being comprehensive chromosomal screening. Right. And then the uh, the uh, the International Committee on uh, um, the uh, nomenclature for for ART. It's it's uh, the, the 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 acronym is ICMART. Um, they have uh, come up with with uh, with sort of new acronyms to to use this. So I think now what they're wanting is, if I remember correctly, it's a PGTA. So it's pre-implantation genetic testing aneuploidy. So really, uh, the the various acronyms aren't as important as sort of understanding what they're trying to do and, and what they're trying to do is test the embryo mm -hmm. to make sure that it's got the normal number of chromosomes and there's not an extra one or a missing one because these embryos for the most part aren't going to result in a normal pregnancy right. so these are embryos typically we would not use for embryo transfer so it's really it's a it's a molecular genetic technology to try to determine if the embryo is chromosomally normal because we know those ones are more likely to result in a pregnancy and an ongoing pregnancy Right. Okay. So, so just take us through a, a an IVF cycle. Uh, yeah. It, it just you know, a aerial view of it, and and how and when the that that testing fits in. Yeah. So uh, you know, when I talk to patients about IVF, there's, uh, you know, I, IVF is magical. I mean, it's been around for forty years now. Louise Brown is is now forty years old. Mm -hmm. Um. And first IVF uh, baby, Lewis. first IVF yeah. baby, yeah. Yeah. and um, and and um, you know, but people will look at the technology magical, but it, but it's or and IVF is magical, but but it's really really simple what we're trying to do. Essentially, each month a, a woman, you know, uh, ovulates one one egg, and so they've got one chance for conception to occur, and a number of things can you know go wrong where that doesn't doesn't happen. IVF is really trying to trying to combine, you know, a year to a year and a half of trying in a, about a three week block. Right. So an IVF cycle first involves ovarian stimulation. So we're trying to convert, you know, uh, a woman's ovaries that only make one mature egg per month to making 10, 15, or even if you're looking at a, at a, uh, PG, uh, S cycle, pre-implantation genetic screening cycle, you're trying to make, you know, maybe maybe 20 eggs, sometimes even more, uh, balancing out the risks of ovarian hyperstimulation. Right. So essentially, it involves 10 to 12 days of taking daily injections under the skin. Uh, these are using um, needles similar to how a diabetic would give them medications, themselves medications. So they're, they're, they're subcutaneous injections that occur for a week to a week and a half to, to two weeks. And during that period of time, the fertility clinic has to do a number of ultrasounds every two or three days to see how the ovaries are responding, uh, hopefully getting your, your targeted ovarian response of 10 to 20 eggs. So that's a stimulation phase. And, and then what you, you go on to is the egg retrieval in the lab phase. So now we need to get those eggs out, and we give medication that will mature the eggs, uh, cause genetic maturation, and we do an ultrasound where a needle goes into the ovary to, to essentially – suck out the fluid from the follicle. Right. Um, the fluid itself is not important for us, but the egg is in that fluid. So the, the embryologists need to isolate the egg. Right. We take the partner or sperm source, whether it's donor sperm or partner sperm, and the sperm and the egg are combined, and over the next five days, those embryos develop in the lab. Now, right. what I tell patients is you don't get an egg from every follicle. They're not all mature. They don't all fertilize, and only about forty percent of them will develop embryos. Right. Okay. So, so you know, you're 40%. trying to make forty percent. Okay. So, typically, in, in somebody who's under thirty-five, we may get you know five, six embryos. Somebody who's in their early forties, it might only be one or two. Right. But there's there's again a wide variability. Right. It depends. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. So that's an IVF cycle. Now you've really got two two options. You can do a fresh embryo transfer and select the embryo based on what it looks like under a microscope. And there's certain appearances of the embryo right. that will tell us this one more likely to implant and result in a pregnancy than this one. Right. But it is a uh, technology that uh, has a lot of observer variability. Right. 
it's obviously, again, semi-quantitative, but still subjective, um, and may not be the best tool for selecting the embryo. Now, that's where things like a PGS come in. And uh, PGS is a tool that, um, with the newer technologies, has now been validated to be able to pick embryos better. What, it, what it's, it's not great at picking an embryo that we know is going to result in a, in a viable ongoing pregnancy. Right. But it is very good, not perfect, but very good at picking embryos that we know that won't right. result in pregnancy. Right. So it allows us to get rid of those embryos from that big group right. that we really probably don't have a lot of business putting back into the uterus and maybe right. saving time and you know maybe a, a miscarriage and, and those types of things. So, right. so it's really an embryo selection tool to select the bad ones out right. um, and then leaves you a pool of embryos that – you know, don't guarantee that they'll implant, but you've gotten rid of the other ones that you don't need to use. Are more likely to, or more likely to. Carefully there are some than, limitations, yeah. which we we can talk about. The you know that it's I say it's very good at picking embryos that won't result in babies, but not perfect. Right. So we do probably discard embryos, not a large number, but a small percentage of embryos with this technology that probably would result in a normal, healthy baby. Right. Because is there, I mean, from from my understanding, the the egg and the embryo are, are have have some wisdom and brilliance built into them where they they can correct, you know, some things along the way, mosaicism, whatever it, 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 yep. it might be. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a couple couple things. There 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 um there um are are two uh, phases of genetic division. Um, for uh, the egg and the sperm meiosis. So there's meiosis one and meiosis two. And you can get errors in, in both, my, you know, both either meiosis one or meiosis two. And there are some studies that suggest that an egg that kind of messes up its uh, genetic division meiosis one, maybe up to 15% of the time, it self-corrects itself by meiosis two. So by testing these we call the polar bodies. So after meiosis one, you'll have one, the first polar body. Okay. And uh, after meiosis two, you have a second polar body. Right. These are the little, um, basically, um, genetic garbage cans okay. Okay. that uh, get rid of the, the uh, genetic material that isn't going to make part of the embryo. Wow. And by testing those, the, they've, they've found that sometimes these eggs will self-correct themselves. They'll maybe won't throw out enough into the garbage can in the first division. Right, right. So they self-correct and throw the extra garbage out in the second garbage can. Interesting, hey? Yeah. yeah. Well, so that, that would not necessarily result in, in what we call a mosaic ember. That would then potentially okay. still result in a completely normal embryo. Now there's okay. this discussion of what's called mosaicism, where you do the genetic testing. Right. And the, the genetic PGS. Yeah, it yeah, seems yeah. to say, no, the embryo isn't normal. It doesn't have 46 chromosomes. It's not abnormal. It doesn't have an extra 47 chromosomes. It seems that maybe some of the cell population has 46 and some has 40, 47. So it's right somewhere, maybe not right in other parts of the embryo. Interesting. And that's where the technology is a little bit of a gray area as well with these mosaic embryos because there is a growing body of evidence to suggest if you transfer a mosaic embryo, it still right. has a very reasonable chance of having a normal baby. Right. So when when a woman's gone through an IVF and she's grown her embryo to to a, a day five or six mm -hmm. to freeze to 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 send away for testing, what what exactly happens in the lab? You know, I know some cells are taken, so it obviously yeah. maybe depends where or or can you explain just simply what happens yeah there. yeah what, what happens so um you know by day five or day six of the embryo embryo development the embryo under the microscope has sorted itself out into specific types of embryonic structures and at this point in time you can look at the embryo and you can identify something called the inner cell mass right, okay. which is what is destined to become the um the embryo and the fetus eventually right. and the right. baby and the trophectoderm, which is destined to become the placenta. Okay. And again, if these all originate from you know one single cell, the zygote that creates the sperm and the egg, then 
and that cell just divides under what's called mitosis and right. divides and divides and divides. Well, then every cell in that embryo theoretically should be the same right. and reflect what the what the initial fertilized egg was. Um, we don't want to biopsy the embryo itself, so we look at taking some cells off the trophectoderm. Around okay. the around the trophectoderm, there's something called the zona pellucida. Uh, if you if you want to think of egg analogies, it's like the egg shell. Shell. Okay. Um, and uh, and and what happens is on day five or day six, uh, typically using a laser. There's other ways to to breach the shell or the zona pellucida, but a little laser is is used to make a, a hole in the embryo, and a few cells from the trophectoderm are then taken off. And by taking more than one cell, taking a few cells, you're more likely to be able to get DNA that you can amplify and identify. So okay. those cells are then frozen and transported to a uh, reference genetics diagnostic lab. Meanwhile, the embryo that you just biopsied is, is frozen, uh, awaiting the results of genetic testing. Right. Okay. So, okay. So, okay. Now the question I think most people would have is, should I, should I, when you explain that they could do this because it's yeah. it's not something that you tell people they have to do right yeah. it's 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 an option within their IVF cycle um right. so the obvious question would be you know should i there's a lot of should i's i'm sure yes. right? yeah 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 and, that's that's a hard hard question to answer and uh, the philosophies with respect to the pre-implantation genetic screening varies from country to country, practitioner to practitioner. Right. Um, I would say that that uh, in North America, especially the United States, there's been a lot more uptake of the technology and okay. in liberal use of it compared to, say, in Europe. Okay. Um, and so it depends on who, who you ask. Um, right. I am uh, a little bit less uh, of an uh, interventionalist, um, so I really explain the pros and the cons. And uh, and and uh, and let let the patients decide. What I do let them know, in one IVF cycle, however many embryos that woman creates, if it's one embryo, two embryos, ten embryos, right. if there is a healthy child in that batch of embryos, there's a healthy child. Right. This technology will not in any way Treat. increase the chance of having a baby from one IVF cycle. Right. Okay. Um, what it does do potentially is reduces the number of embryo transfers you may have to undergo, especially if you have a a large number of of um, of embryos, or may reduce the number of potential failed transfers. Because if you have ten embryos, and let's say we take someone who's in their late thirties, and we know on average half of those embryos are going to be abnormal, it allows us to get rid of on half five of the 10 embryos right. seeing a hypothetical, very good responder patient here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so some, and, and, and really what it, it, it gets you, I always tell patients, you, you don't, you're not, you know, you're not paying for an increased chance of, 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 of having a successful treatment. You're really paying for information. So right. the pros are, you may have fewer transfers, you get information and you, uh, potentially then, are able to identify embryos that you know have a extremely low chance of implanting. Right. right. Um, I find that people who maybe uh, had a pregnancy effect, you know, affected by maybe a miscarriage where it's been a chromosome abnormality, or pregnancy that's been affected by chromosome abnormality, um, and that for them has been a very maybe uh, adverse or, or outcome that they did not want to experience. Right. They may use this technology. Uh, I find other p times when, when patients have done multiple IVF cycles and it hasn't worked, they want answers from you and you don't have them. Right, so right. Sometimes we talk about this technology. Now, what are the downsides? Well, it adds significant cost to treatment. Cost, yeah. yeah. You, when you biopsy an embryo, there's a chance that you might damage the embryo. It's probably right. about 1% to 2% chance of an embryo being damaged. Okay. When we take a few cells. Now, if you think about... Um, these CSI shows where they're do, you know, doing DNA testing or right, you okay. your crime show seeing do, DNA testing from a dr drop of blood. Yeah. A drop of blood is a ton of DNA compared to what we're working with. Sometimes it's ah. one, two, five cells. So okay. you may not get enough DNA to amplify and then you may have to decide whether you biopsy the embryo again. Okay. 
those are some of the downsides. Some other things, you know, even if you identify an, an, a completely normal embryo, there's no 100% chance that that's going to work. It's maybe about 60% chance that the embryo is going to work. And, and then the, 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 you know, one of the final things are. So unfortunately, there haven't been a lot of well-designed studies in this in this technology for some of the things, such as the, the technology validation. But there, there are one lab in the United States. They've, they've done a real good job of validating technology. And one of the, the big steps was, trying to figure out if the embryo is normal, how likely is it going to result in a baby? And what about if the embryo is abnormal? If you put an abnormal embryo in, identified as being chromosomally abnormal, right. what happens? And and it, and it and so this one lab in the U.S. did this. They transferred embryos in, into a woman's uterus. They didn't, and they did the biopsy. This is before the technology had really been proven to work. Yeah. And so they did the biopsy. They did the genetic testing, but they didn't know what the results were when they put the embers in. They said, okay, well, we'll just see what the pregnancy outcome is. Right, right. And then we'll look at the results, Compare. essentially. Right. Happen. So when you transfer a chromosomally normal embryo, I think in that study it was in the high 50s. Now success rates have gotten higher. So if it was normal, pretty good implantation rate. But I think the more interesting part was if you put a chromosomally abnormal embryo back into a woman's uterus with this technology, 4% of the time, it resulted in a normal, healthy, chromosomally normal baby. So if you make the assumption to larger numbers that this 4% number holds true in a much larger data set, then one out of t every 25 embryos that we biopsy and we say are abnormal, we're throwing out and they may be resulted, they could have resulted in a live birth. So it's a small number, but we are occasionally, probably, almost certainly discarding embryos that could result in a pregnancy. So there are some limitations to technology. It's not perfect. Right. Well, I remember, John, it was, it was even earlier in the days. It must have been a couple of years ago. You and I were out for, for a dinner, and, and we were talking about PGS. And uh, it was really interesting to me because you kind of had... I think it maybe you know was partly due to age, but just more so just coincidentally that uh, when a woman responds and and produces x amount of of eggs and and resulting in you know x amount of embryos, which is a fairly low number two four mm. six I forget what we were talking about yeah um, uh, where is the point where it's worthwhile doing you know the pgs or or maybe just you know just transfer because it's yeah. it's going to tell you the tale that way anyway exactly and and that uh, another hard question to answer it's, it's hard to oh, say sorry. what the, the, the right the right number is so yeah. you can talk to some uh, infertility specialists that think you should never put an embryo in if it hasn't been biopsied and tested and i really think that that's really getting a bit carried away personally i mean i'm more pragmatic i mean if you've got one or two embryos right. um why not transfer the one or two embryos right. because the gold standard of you know is this a good embryo or not is are you pregnant do you have a healthy baby from it right. and really this technology you know again tells you pretty good about embryos that won't work not as well as saying yeah this embryo will but gets rid of the ones that won't but again, the gold standard still is you have a healthy baby from technology. So it's really hard to say when you should be biopsying and when you when you shouldn't. Um, I, I think if you have, um, as you get older, the chromosome abnormality rates go up significantly. Also, as you get older, you tend to make fewer embryos. Right. So if you're, you know, you're you're 42 and, and you've got one or two embryos, well, you can be pretty sure that there's probably a 70 to 80% of chance that those embryos are going to be chromosomally abnormal. So do you spend several thousand dollars to biopsy those embryos to determine that and then find out they're both abnormal and not do an embryo transfer? Or do you just transfer them back into the uterus and and and, and see what happens? And, right. and when you think... Well, that's kind of crazy. If there's 70 to 80 percent chance that these embryos are chromosomally abnormal, and you're going to put a chromosomally abnormal embryo into my uterus, and that's going to result in an ongoing pregnancy that's that may be chromosomally abnormal. Well, the right. fact of the matter is, most chromosomally abnormal embryos don't implant. Right. Okay. If they do implant, they may miscarry. Right. Um, but most 
commonly they just don't implant. Right. When we think about things like Down syndrome, which is probably one of the most well-known chromosomal abnormalities, you look at a 42-year-old, it's the chance of you having a chrom- uh, tr- uh, Down syndrome, which is an extra chromosome 21, is is somewhere between 1% to 2%. Okay. It's still pretty, pretty low. Right. So, um, yeah, you have to ask yourself, what is it you're trying to do? And, you know, at the end of the day, if you have one or two embryos, I often think that maybe just transferring them and, and seeing what happens rather than going through the, all the, the, the issues with testing. And prenatal screening options are so prenatal screening options are so vast now too. So yes. you could, you know, at ten weeks, ten to twelve weeks now, you can find out a lot about your baby. Yeah, and, and one of the questions patients will ask me: they've done IVF, they've done the genetic screening of the embryos. Well, do I need to do any prenatal screening? Right. Um, Good question. So. I'm not aware of Ken having a specific guideline. The U.S. a couple of years ago issued a guideline. They said if you're doing a prenatal screening test and it's normal, they say don't do another test okay. except for pre-implantation genetic screening. They still recommend if you do PGS and it's normal, you should still either do non-invasive prenatal testing or okay. knuckle translucency or an integrated pregnancy screen, depending on what's being offered in your in your jurisdiction. Okay. But they do still recommend. And, and there is some data out of the United States suggesting if you put a chromosomally normal embryo in the uterus and that chromosomally normal embryo implants and becomes a clinical pregnancy, so you see something on the ultrasound, the chance that that pregnancy, which you were told is chromosomally normal, but a one in 500 chance that it's not. It's chromosomally abnormal. Oh, so okay. right. that is really the rationale to still at, at least consider or offer some sort of prenatal, not pre-implantation, but prenatal testing on top of what's already been done. Right. So there's there's a lot of factors, hey, because of where you take this, you know, the cells come off and so there might be you know, you might have got just a bad little bunch of cells and that, that embryo yeah. still was okay. Okay. Especially if you're talking about, again, the theory behind mosaicism and let's say there's an early mitotic error and so you've got a cell population, some are normal, some are abnormal, you biopsy on day five and you've gotten the little patch of normal cells. Right. But what ends up happening is the abnormal cells basically take over and you've got an abnormal pregnancy. That's one of the theories. Or the, right. the other possibility is, is just see the again the technology is not perfect. Right, right. And what what was what yeah. was thought by the, you know, DNA amplification and and the mathematical you know calculations to determine whether it's aneuploid or not. Right. It it just didn't reach that threshold for whatever reason, and and it misidentified an embryo as normal. Right. Or the opposite of of maybe there being still being some sort of corrective technology inside the the embryo you know for you know that uh where it might go the wrong way <laughs> yeah 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 um okay so so that's great i think that gives everyone you know a a, a good sense because it's uh, it's crazy you think you are going into ivf and and it's just you're going to be told exactly what you need to do <laughs> but there yeah. are some options still and some, yeah yeah you know some decisions you're going to have to sit with yeah um and but that that's great. I thank you for that information. It's such new technology for people, and and I think it's being, um, you know, like you said, some people it's it it may be more the holy grail in their opinion in their clinical yeah. practice than others, and and so it's uh, so collecting information, doing your due diligence yourself as well as is, is. Are there good places for people to to do some research? Because there's probably stuff all over the internet or. Is yeah, that hard? that's hard. Hey? Yeah, it, it is really um, uh, difficult. I mean, I think part of the concern is um, if you go to certain websites, especially websites where the companies have a, you know, yeah. financial or commercial interest in the technology, yeah. they're going to maybe color um, the rationale to do it in a certain way. There's a bit of a, sure. a vested interest in, in, mm-hmm. in doing it. So, so you, you just have to be careful about the commercial websites. Um, there are essentially the, you know, the best places if you can get access to the medical literature, right. um, the American society for reproductive medicine. I'm not sure, uh, their, um, patient information with respect to 
to uh, um, PGS, but they, they do often have a lot of patient resources on there. Right, right. Um, ASRM. Just, yeah. ASRM, yeah. The, you know, the, you, you just definitely want to make sure that the information you're getting, the, the people giving it to you don't yeah. have a self-interest and yeah. there's some, some scientific basis behind it. Yeah, and uh, and know that it also might have some opinion if it is uh, a practitioner. So, so, yeah. so ultimately, it is something that you probably have to make a, a, a decision that's, you know, takes in all the logic you can and all the information you can and then follow follow your heart if no one's given you a clear, you should do this or, or not. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. And again, my, if, you, if you ask my personal approach, I mean, I, again, I give them the pros and cons. I tell patients, if the government was picking up the tab for this technology, I would say then then, then go for it. Yeah, but you yeah. still got to be aware of the risks and benefits. It's not the holy grail. Yeah. And then I often find patients will uh, be interested in, in doing it more often if they've had multiple failed embryo transfers right. um, or if they've had a preg previous pregnancy affected by a chromosome abnormality. I find that there may be an early uptake for using the technology then. Right. Because yeah. that, I, I don't know if it's still really kind of the messaging that go, goes out there, but for a while, maybe, you know, a, a few years, <clears throat> it seemed that, oh, the PGD or the PGS uh, is good for women that have uh, experienced uh, recurrent pregnancy loss. Yes. Yeah. So, and the, the scientific rationale for that, it makes perfect sense. Right. Um, you know, uh, a lot of miscarriages are due to chromosomal abnormalities. The right. majority are, right. uh, probably at least half. Um, and so if you could then test these embryos, then, uh, then, then you you could potentially avoid that. Right now, the issue with respect to recurrent miscarriages sometimes these patients are not having any difficulty getting pregnant. Right, they're just having difficulty Keeping. staying pregnant. Mm -hmm. So then you're you're taking somebody who has no infertility issues and putting them through IVF and, and PGD and all the costs associated with that. Um, there and and the and the um. PGS studies have concentrated specifically on infertility, couples with right. infertility. Right. So at least the very well-designed studies. Now, there was some, uh, a, a, a study published a couple of years ago on the West Coast out of uh, Seattle and San Francisco where they looked at the recurrent miscarriage population. It's not a randomized trial, which is sort of the, the gold standard trials, right. but it was, a, it was a trial where they looked at the women who had recurrent miscarriage and they looked at the women who decided, uh, the one group that decided we're going to do IVF and chromosome screening, and they looked at the group that decided, no, we're just going to keep trying on our own. Right. And they looked over a six-month period of time, not, not a, you know, a reasonable length of time, but not a real long period of time. And they wanted to look and see what's the chance that you'd have a conception that then subsequently resulted in a live birth over the next six months. Right, right. And time to pregnancy as well. Yeah. And they found that your chance of having a baby, uh, a healthy uh, live birth, right. uh, in the PGS group was the exact same as the group that just said, we're going to keep trying on our own for the next six months. Uh, the group that just kept trying on their own for the next six months didn't have to spend multiple thousands of dollars on treatment. Right, right. And the time to pregnancy was no different between the two groups. There was a non-significant difference between the two groups. And if anything, the just trying on our own group got pregnant a little bit quicker. Right, so, right. Um, again, we don't have great studies. This is all we have. But um, in the... the Biologic plausibility of doing the technology for recurrent miscarriage makes complete sense. So far, the data doesn't seem to support it, though. Okay. Okay. So, all right. So, looking into, uh, you know, obviously, P PGS is is something that you decide on when you go through an IVF cycle, mm -hmm. um, and you have embryos that can be biopsied. But is there, you know, is there? The testing that happens beforehand, like the antrofollicle count ultrasounds, the FSH and estradiol testing, and the AMH, mm -hmm. anti-valerian mm -hmm. hormone, is that picture that's painted beforehand seemingly going to correlate? Or, or I know it's it, it correlates with age a lot, but is it going to yeah. correlate with with viable embryos as well? Or, or 
It, yeah, it, it so the, the ovarian reserve tests, um, they aren't so, you know, a common thing, you know, people especially we talk about delayed childbearing, they'll, they'll order one of these tests, right. you know, the anti-malarian hormone being being sort of the, the, the newer one out of the group, um, that, that, you know, they'll order this test, give me the result, and they'll say, okay, well, I haven't been trying to get pregnant, but, you know, uh, how am I, can I wait two years? Um right. These and the antrofollicle count essentially is an ultrasound to look at the resting follicles, and day, and then the day three FSH is a, you know, a, a blood test that's done the third day of the period, and if it's high, that means the over, ovaries aren't working as well. None of these are very good tests of your chance of spontaneously conceiving. So if you haven't been trying to get pregnant, you know, you order one of these tests, it's not going to tell me whether you're not you're going to get pregnant in the in the next year or so if you haven't been trying. Okay. The day three FSH, when it gets real high, might predict it a, a little bit, but 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 they aren't really good tests. What they and and are they very good tests of predicting success with IVF? None of them are really good t- predictors of IVF. Day three FSH might be, especially when you're getting uh, above uh, twenty, you've got a real low chance that, that IVF is going to work. Okay. If you've got an AMH level that's undetectable. It's going to predict the success rate with IVF because you probably won't make any, or you might make one or two eggs. And, okay. You know, but if you've got you know moderately low antifollicle count, or moderately low anti-malarian hormone, they're not great predictors of whether IVF is going to work. Not great. A little bit. They do predict how many eggs you'll make okay. when we stimulate you, and and to some degree, eggs do correlate with pregnancy rates. But really, once you get above eight to ten eggs. The chance of you getting pregnant in that embryo trans, that fresh embryo transfer, really doesn't change eight to ten versus fifteen versus twenty. But when you get more eggs, it does increase your what we call your cumulative uh, IVF pregnancy rate. So that's really talking about your chance of having a baby from the IVF cycle, including the fresh embryo transfer and all the frozen embryos. So, but if we're just looking at at on that that one single single embryo transfer, as long as your AMH is not real, real low and your FSH is not real, real high, it's not a great predictor. And these really just predict how many eggs you're going to make. Right. Okay. So that, so there, so you touched on it quickly, but uh, what role do they play then in spontaneous or, or natural conception? Yeah, so, so they... good question. So, so they, they've looked and AMH doesn't seem to predict uh, um, spon- spontaneous pregnancy rate at all. So what, okay. what the, the Danish group did what was interesting. They took a bunch of their women in the infertility clinic who they all ordered AMHs on. Yeah. And then they also, in that hospital that they work out of, did, did, did got a research-approved research study, and they recruited a bunch of female workers at the hospital who've recently had a baby. Okay. You know, they've had it, and I right. can't remember, one year or two years, but recently had a baby. And they said, well, we want to test your AMH levels because we want to see you as a big group. Do you guys have higher AMH levels than our infertility population? And it was no different. Okay. They found within the infertility population, some women have low AMH, some women have average AMH, and some women have high AMH. And in the fertile population, some women had low, some had mm. average, some had high. And it distributed itself out essentially the same. Interesting. So – there have been some other similar types of studies, and again, AMH does not seem to predict chances of conceiving spontaneously. I, I think I remember it was a number of years ago when the WHO finally updated their uh, semen analysis parameters. Mm-hmm. Um, to my understanding, you could confirm or correct whatever I'm saying, but the 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 parameters of of what normal sperm uh, constituted mm-hmm. had never included the studies of fertile men. Mm-hmm. Is that right? So, well, the, and then so the most recent the most recent semen analysis parameters are based the most recent ones now are based on fertile people. Right. So they took uh, a number of individuals who had had a, a recent pregnancy and got their semen parameters. And they essentially did um, um, calculations of the mean and standard deviation. And they basically said anyone above the, you know, anyone in the five, fifth percent, under the fifth percentile, so the P 
people with the lowest parameters right. of volume, concentration, motility, morphology, you know, the lowest 5%, we will use that as a cutoff, and that's what we'll consider abnormal. Right. But just be, but that you still got to remember those five percent of people are the five percent of people who still had babies with no problem. Right, right. Uh, Interesting. So uh, when you get uh, again, just like having abnormal AMH, an abnormal semen parameter doesn't necessarily predict fertility. Again, um, it's really really low. But but you can have you know s some abnormalities in one parameter, and that just means you might be a little bit low. Right. Everyone's always hoping for that. Uh... You, you using your terminology that holy grail test that's gonna you know yes. give us give us like feedback that's just heavenly and helping determine you know clinical decision making etc but yes it always seems to still come down to collecting as much info as you can then making you know a you know a decision on based on yeah. your experience and you know, maybe your colleagues. Yeah. We're, we're, we're still, we're still dealing a lot of, a lot of medicine has to do with probabilities, right? You've got this percent chance of it working, whether we're talking about infertility, cancer treatment, uh, you know, right. treat your diabetes, heart attack, you, you usually dealing with probabilities. And, and as we get better, we'll maybe be able to refine, you know, patients into categories a little bit better, but you know, people always want to know, well, you know, why did I end up in the, you know, 60% that worked, you know, whether it be your cancer treatment or, or your fertility treatment and, you know, this other person ended up in the 40% that didn't. And, and unfortunately, a lot of times we don't, we don't know, which is, know. which is difficult. Yeah. Right. But so, I always tell people at the end of the day, we, I can give you probabilities. Right. At the end of the day, when you do the therapy, you, you need that information for you to make an informed decision. Yeah. You will not be 60% pregnant or 40% pregnant or 20% pregnant, whatever your pregnancy rate may amount to based on your, on your um, you know, individual parameters, age, right. ovarian reserve. You'll be 0% pregnant or 100% pregnant. Right, so you've right. You've got to use the probability to make a decision and then move uh, forward. just kind of have to move forward. Yeah. So just a rewinding um, – so you mentioned uh, AMH not really being a predictor of spontaneous or natural pregnancy, but when you put together that with 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 the antral follicle count, ultrasound, and FSH and estrogen levels, is there day three? Mm -hmm. Is that is what is it telling people? You know, is it giving them an idea of whether they're just basically closer to the end of their reproductive years? Or, or what info can they it, get? From it them? does. I mean, I mean, a, a real, you know, a real high FSH level is going to be have a, a prognostic value for an IVF cycle. It's likely to end up in a IVF cycle cancellation, and so you won't end up pregnant because we don't get to the egg retrieval. Same with an undetectable anti-malarian hormone. If, the, if it's below the lower limit of the assay, so if it's like, um, uh, you know, like uh, one one under one picomolar, well, there's probably about a fifty percent chance. That that IVF cycle will be canceled and you won't get to egg retrieval. So it's going to predict, it's going to have a prognostic value because you don't have time, you don't even get to get to an egg retrieval. Right. Um, it, it we know individuals who have lower AMH levels, and we people who don't respond well to IVF and end up with cycle cancellations, they tend to get go into over, uh, into menopause earlier. Right. Okay. But trying to predict that date is 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 impossible i tell i tell people you will go into menopause earlier but i don't know if that's going to be next month or five right, five years right, from now. Right. yeah that's still crystal ball i say they did okay. when i graduated medical school they did not give me the crystal ball so it's yeah 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 <laughs> so but to be clear there's actually a, a psychic fair here today i just yeah. anyway just yeah. ir irony but um to <laughs> to be clear uh the word quality would come up then because i it, are people mistakenly equating these tests with lower parameters to a quality or what qualities uh, so would there be it becomes there? more of a quantity issue quantity. as opposed to quality yeah quality is pretty much dependent on on age age um and uh, and and so the elevated fsh and the low amh really reflect Quantity. So quantity. you may not you may not even get an embryo because you don't get to the egg retrieval, or right, you're right. going to have fewer embryos to to test. But it seems to be predominantly a right. quantity rather than quality. Age is the really the almost sole predictor of, of of quality. Right. 
So yeah. what what are the cases, uh, you know, the parameters in age where it would be, you know, more likely for someone to achieve their goal naturally than with IVF? And, and you would be honest about that, you know, with, with a patient in front of you. Well, I, you know, I, I think the, the, uh, the, obviously the younger somebody is and the shorter duration they've been trying to conceive, the higher the chance that, that they're going to, they're going to get pregnant on their own. I, right. I, okay. I, you know, I, I tell couples, you know, if you look at these, you know, the spontaneous pregnancy data from, you know, populations in Quebec in the 1800s, Hutterites in the 1800s, early 1900s, uh, some other populations prior to contraception, prior to, you know, uh, uh, relationship breakdowns and, right. and long-term stable relationships where, where large families were, were, were valued. Um, you, you would see that the overall infertility rate, you know, the chance of essentially the sterility rate where, you know, a married couple don't have any children is maybe 2 to 3%. Right. Um, by the time you get to age 35, though, about 1 in 9 uh, um, women are unable to to have a, a successful ongoing pregnancy. By age forty, it's one in three. Age forty one, it goes to one in two, uh -huh. and then by age forty five, we're almost at ninety percent. So you can see okay. that big decline. And it does, to some degree, also reflect how long you've been trying to get pregnant. So if you look at somebody who's under age thirty five, they've only been trying to get pregnant for a year, uh, which after a year of trying, eighty five percent of that population will be pregnant. So you look at the 15% left over. I tell them between year one and year two, if you've, your fertility testing is normal, you got close to 50% chance of getting pregnant, even if you just keep trying on your own. Right. So in the younger population, definitely in the late 20s, early 30s, we encourage uh, typically not if all the testing is normal to really wait two years to try to conceive. Right. Uh, once you start getting the you know, late 30s, early 40s, you, know, you might want to be thinking about treatment after six to 12 months, depending on what – what end of that age range you're, you're looking at. Right. Is, is it true, just bottom line, I'm not sure if there's a bumper or two or a dip in this, but the younger you are, the, the greater the chance that IVF, yeah, I, I know there's confounding you know, factors, but the younger you are, the, the greater the chance that IVF will be successful for you. Yeah, and really, you know, even even at age 32 and above, you start to see subtle declines in, in IVF right. success rates. And at 37, 38, it starts to go down right. quite a bit. Yeah. By the time you hit age 45, you're looking at a 2 to 3% chance that IVF is going to work using your own eggs. Right. Um, so it's really under age 32 where you're going to see the, the highest success rates. Yeah, okay. Because, I mean, I almost at any age, you know, sometimes when I see younger patients, you know, late twenties, early thirties, unexplained infertility commonly, um, at that age, I, if they start even thinking about IVF, sometimes I, you know, I'm like, well, if, if it's something you want to do, go have your first child through IVF. You know, I almost yeah. guarantee your next one will, will I can't guarantee anything, but yeah. it will come, will come on your own, you know, it, yeah. you know, barring any other major blockages. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, that, and that's kind of my messaging to almost anybody. If, if something's come on your radar and you're feeling a, a pull toward it, regardless of statistic or, 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 you know, you're young and you should continue on trying naturally or, I, you know, it, do what feels right for you because you're going to have a whole yeah. bunch of people telling you what's what's right or wrong so if yeah. i mean i have all i know for sure john is that i've never met a woman or a couple that has regretted doing ivf when they're holding a baby yes you know? yes absolutely yes yeah and for some people that that's it you know it's um some people don't want to wait two three four years they, yeah. they want to go and 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 there are less sort of financially and, and medically intensive treatments that you can engage in before IVF for a lot of people, which are, are very uh, good treatments, don't have the same okay. success rates, but are often sort of the intermediate treatments before you get to IVF. And we often talk about doing those before IVF, but <laughs> sometimes uh, sometimes um, uh, people say, no, I'm just for, for logistics issues and success yeah. rates issues. They just say, we, we want to go to IVF because, yeah. you know, 
and somebody uh, for for most people, especially in, under under age forty, definitely in the twenties and early thirties, there's no treatment that's going going to really beat that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, you know, it it, it if there's a finan- if there's no financial barriers, then then I I see over the years now I've been doing this not as long as <laughs> you, but almost fifteen years now it, with this focus I, in fertility. I've seen such a change because you know everyone knows somebody that's been through an IVF basically now I think mm. it's it's almost to that place you know or, yeah. or, or is once removed um, and and the stigma of it is is largely you know been uh, uh, it's not a big mystery as to yeah. how it how it works anymore um, so I I I love, you know, to, to encourage people to find their route. Cause I think I practice Chinese medicine, you know, mm-hmm. and, and people come to me expecting, you know, I don't know what they're expecting. Actually, they don't know probably half the time, but, um, you know, someone who may not typically their people practicing may not necessarily have, a, uh, a balanced perspective of, of how and what, you know, uh, people should be doing. There may be, uh, dogmatic, um, you know, beliefs in, in this medicine or that. And to me, it's, you know, let's get you to your goal. Yes. If, if you're open to IVF, that is fantastic. I would love to work with you for a bit and get you healthy, especially if there's weight issues or whatever it might be um, beforehand, you know, and then I'll, you can go see John and we'll just hopefully be optimizing your chances of success, you know, but I, 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 I think it comes as a really comforting, uh, 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 a real comfort to people when they come to someone like me and, and I'm, in, I'm the one that's encouraging them to keep doors open like IVF, to keep whatever path it is that you're meant to get to your baby with, leave that open and, and, and be willing to explore it because I guarantee you'll be happy no matter which way you get to your goal. Yeah. 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 You know, and it, and it's, um, it, uh, I, when, when, when people, when, when couples or, or patients don't want to do IVF, I obviously want to try to explore the, the, the reasons why, yeah. um, you know, sometimes people have misconceptions. Sometimes there's a, uh, a moral or ethical, um, issue that, right. that they have with the technology and, and it, I'm never going to be one to try to talk an individual out of, you know, the set of beliefs. Right. Um, unfortunately, and, and this is where I get on my soapbox, unfortunately, I, IVF is very expensive. Right. And unfortunately, outside of Ontario, nowhere in Canada insures this. Of course, Quebec had their, you know, experiment with insuring it for several years. And that is, without a doubt, the number one barrier to doing IVF for a couple is finances. Yes. And the experiment in Quebec where they had funding in late 2010, they had funding for five years. Um, and the IVF utilization rate, so the number of people doing IVF per capita overnight went up by 250 to 300%. And then when they took funding away, it went back to what the baseline rate for the rest of Canada was. It was hey. That tells you that funding is the number one yeah. Uh, barrier to accessing IVF. If you look at the country that has the highest IVF utilization rate yeah. in the world, it's Israel. And the okay. reason being is in Israel, they will fund as many IVF cycles as you want to do. How did they so, do that? <laughs> I don't know. But the they, oil they, wells are deep. They, so yeah, it can, yeah. You know, so no, not every, you know, some people obviously at some point in time stop doing the treatment, but they have the highest IVF utilization rate per capita. Yeah. And so it's really access and access predominantly has to de- do with funding and, and it's there's nothing uh you know more depressing when you, you see somebody who wants to do the treatment may very well do well with the treatment and, and can't afford it that's yeah. tough and i tell my patients i would you know write your uh mla you know write the health minister and really get get the information out there that this is really important. Infertility is a disease. It's recognized as a disease. Right. Our government will pay to in- investigate and diagnose your disease, but they will not pay to treat your disease. Yeah, it's crazy. And it's, it's sad. Yeah. I mean, the, 
the disease yeah i mean the psychological impact alone is disease i mean it's it's yeah. it's massive and that's i see a lot of that and and deal with a lot of that side yeah. can you what i'm i'm sorry i'm going to let you go here i know it's getting late yeah. but uh um what is the difference in like i always understood that the the cost of ivf in canada is is uh considerably uh less expensive than in the us but am I correct in that? And if I am correct in that, why don't so many Americans come to Canada for IVF? Well, yeah, it, it is less expensive in Canada than the U.S. And, and, and especially the Americans have a stronger dollar. So yeah, if you yeah. see, if you then factor in the exchange rate, um, there's going to be greater savings. Yeah. Right, the, one, one of the issues so becomes, and or, or for example, for that matter, we have people in Canada who maybe are from another country and there are other countries that provide IVF at a much lower rate than Canada does. Right, right. And so, you know, sometimes people will talk about doing IVF or fertility treatments outside of Canada even in, yeah. in, a, in a lower cost um, jurisdiction. But then you have to factor in the cost of travel, travel and cost of having to take a couple of weeks off of work and maybe loss of employment income and cost of accommodations wherever you're going. And, and so even the Americans, by the time you factor in all those costs, they're almost certainly not going to see a, a savings be, because of that. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I, I, is there anything else you want to touch on, John? Otherwise, I'm going to let you you get to bed. We're we're fairly late here on the west coast of uh, uh, Canada. Is there anything else you want to leave leave people? With? No, I, I had a, I had a a great time. I'd awesome. uh, love to do this again. We'll have to come up with some more topics. Pick to a new topic. Yeah. I think we uh, I think we touched on on a lot today, but there's yeah. always more more to talk about, and look forward to doing this again. Yeah, awesome. So if if there is anyone out there that wants to uh, come to Canada to beautiful Vancouver. I know lots of people do for their IVF to come to John, Dr. Havelock at the Pacific Center for Reproductive Medicine. Where can they, how can they get a hold of you? Uh, website, so our, our, yeah, our, our website is www.pacificfertility.ca. It's all one word. Uh, we've got a uh, location in uh, Burnaby, British Columbia and a, a new clinic in Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, and uh, you can look us up on the uh, website. Our uh, our phone contact and all our other information is is there. And we've got a lot of resources for phys physicians and patients. And feel free to uh, contact us if you want to know more. Yeah, it's a great website. They've got a great team there. There's John Least, three other physicians there. Um, uh, you have prenatal screening and and care there too, as well as. Uh, you know, um, some really great uh, urologists that uh, yeah, work with you guys as well and some some other procedures I know you do as well. But uh, maybe we can touch on, 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 on some of that another time or research or maybe we'll get feedback. If you want uh, John to touch on anything, let me know and, uh, and we'll get him back on the show. But otherwise, I really appreciate you taking out the time and uh, and we'll chat with you again soon, John. Thank you, me, and uh, I'll uh, see you soon. Okay, right on. Take care. Bye.